One of the things that affects the quality of our radiographs, apart from exposure factors such as KVP and MAS, and other things such as the SID and the applied filter, is what we call the anode heal effect. It's one of those factors that influences x-ray production and the quality of our images, just by the inherent design of the x-ray tube. And so in this video, I'm going to take you through and explain what the anode heal effect is, because it's not immediately obvious by its name, its causes and implications, that is what it means for us, and the strategies to mitigate or lessen its impact on our images. You know, like making lemonade with your lemons. Anyway, now to really understand the anode heal effect, you first need to understand the basic components and operations of an x-ray tube, which I've made a separate video on, so if you're already pretty good with that, then keep watching. But if not, you'll get a lot more out of this video if you watch that one first. It's the first link down below the like button. See you soon. All right, welcome back. So hopefully you're coming into this with a general understanding of what goes on in an x-ray tube. But knowing you, you didn't even pause the video, did you? All right, I'll give you a TLDR. As you know, the x-ray tube consists of two main inner components, which is where it all happens. That is the cathode and the anode. The cathode is the negative end, gets heated and is where the electrons leave in a process called thermionic emission, a very fancy word. And the anode is a target material and the positive end, usually made from tungsten and is where it receives the electrons coming at high speed from the cathode. The collision of which is what causes the x-rays to be produced. And it's this collision that we need to pay attention to, so let's zoom in a little bit. The anode heal effect is a consequence of the geometry of the anode. In most x-ray tubes, at least the ones that I know of, the anode is angled relative to the beam's path, meaning that if the x-ray beam is coming straight like this, then the anode is at some angle to that so it doesn't just bounce back. And this angulation is actually required to allow for better and more efficient heat management, which as a result prolongs the tube's life. However, because of the geometry of the beam as it hits the anode, there's a variation in x-ray intensity across the beam, with the lower intensity on the anode side, the heel, and the higher intensity on the cathode side. Now this intensity variation that we see is due to the absorption and attenuation of x-rays in the thicker part of the anode material. So what that means is that as the electrons come from the cathode and hit the anode, more of those electrons are absorbed on the anode side than they are on the cathode side of the anode. And you can see that on the diagram here. It's quite literally a function of the geometry of the situation, where these lines here pass through more of the metal anode before emerging compared to the other side. And when more is absorbed on the anode or heel end, then that part of the exiting x-ray beam has less intensity. And this of course happens along a gradient because the anode angle is constant. And therefore as a result, you get one end, the anode side, having much fewer x-rays compared to the cathode side. It's kind of like self attenuation on the anode side. And this is why we're limited on how much variation we can actually have on the anode angle. Because if you reduce it too much, the anode heal effect will be magnified. All right, so hopefully you have a good understanding of what the anode heal effect is and really why it exists. Let's not talk about the different factors that influence it. The first I just mentioned, and that is the anode angle, where the steeper the anode angle, the more pronounced the heel effect. Now this isn't something that we can really change, it's set by the manufacturer. So they really need to make sure it's an ideal angle, and they usually have it between 12 to 15 degrees, which is probably a lot less than you thought I bet. So the smaller the anode angle is, the more anode heel effect you get. But at the same time, you get a smaller focal spot size. And this is the second factor, where the large focal spot size can exacerbate the heel effect. Now what even is a focal spot size? I'll cover this in detail in another video, link down below once it's ready. But basically, when we have a beam of electrons coming in from the cathode towards the anode, it's not coming in one straight tiny beam of electrons, but rather it's more of a band of electrons, the size of which is dependent on the size of the cathode filament. Because if the filament is larger, that's when we've selected the broad focus option. Because then the band of electrons coming in is thicker, and therefore the effective focal spot is larger. Oh, by the way, this is what's called the actual focal spot, and what comes out of it is what the effective outcome from it all is, called the effective focal spot, which is pretty self-explanatory. And of course, if you use a fine focus, it's a smaller band, and therefore a smaller focal spot size, etc. Anyways, all that to say is that if we have a larger focal spot size, whether it be from the size of the cathode filament or from the anode of the angle, because both can affect it, then that affects the severity of the anode heal effect. Again, just looking at the geometry of it all, if the band of electrons is is thicker, then there's more that gets absorbed through the anode material on the anode side, compared to if it was a much smaller band of electrons. Hopefully that makes sense, I've tried to make it clear with the drawings, because it's almost impossible to understand with just text on a slide, at least for me. Now the third thing that affects the anode heal effect is the target material, so what that anode is made of where the density and atomic number of the anode material affects X-ray absorption. And the anode is usually made of a material called tungsten, which has an atomic number of 74, and has a very high melting point of 3,370 degrees. And this kind of makes it suitable for bremsstrahlung radiation production, 
But then the anode can also be made of molybdenum and rhodium, which have atomic numbers of 42 and 45 respectively. Now these are mainly used in mammography units because they're better at producing characteristic x-rays, which are more suited for that type of imaging. If you forgot what characteristic or bremsstrahlung radiation are, I've made a video on it, so I'll leave that link down below for you. Anyways, this factor is a relatively minor one and not really what we focus on for the anode heal effect. And so the last two things that affect the anode heal effect are the SID and the collimation. Let me explain. So firstly, SID stands for source to image distance or more fully source to image receptor distance. Basically how far the x-ray tube is is from the detector. And you know, the common SIDs we use are 100 to 110 centimeters and 180 centimeters. But then sometimes 150 or 120, depending on the exam and adaptation of technique that we're using. What happens when we increase the SID? Well, if you've ever done that, the first thing you realize is that the light beam gets bigger, right? It's a cone shape after all. And because it gets bigger, usually when we increase our tube distance, we also bring down the collimation or cone down, as we say, because we don't need as much to expose. You know, if your tube is at 100 SID and you bring it all the way out to 180 SID without changing the collimation, you're gonna see light on the walls. So when we cone down, what's really happening is that the overall beam is becoming straighter. You've removed the outer edges of the cone beam, which were at an angle given the cone shape. And so you're effectively looking at the more central part of the beam that is in effect reducing the anode heal effect because it's mainly focusing on the center of that emitted beam from the anode and ignoring the outer edges that were causing the difference in attenuation and therefore exposure because they're being collimated out. Make sense? All right, those were some of the factors that affect the magnitude of the anode heal effect. I also wanna talk about the implications and how we can actually try to use the anode heal effect to our advantage. And both of these have to do with what's called image uniformity, given the difference in x-ray intensities across the beam. Let's start off with the clinical implication. That is what effect it has and what it really means for you. The variation in x-ray intensity across the beam that I talked about leads to uneven exposure on a radiographic film or detector, results in an image that is darker on one side and lighter on the other. Can you guess which side is which? Take a moment to really think about it. So if we know that there's a higher x-ray intensity on the cathode side, you can think of this as more intensity hitting the detector towards the cathode side. And so less gets absorbed if there was a patient there. And when less gets absorbed, that is when more x-ray intensities are hitting the detector, the image looks darker. And so in other words, there's barely anything stopping the beam and it's all going towards the detector. And the opposite is also true. That is when the x-ray beam is more absorbed in a hypothetical patient on the anode side, the image should look a little whiter. Think of any radiograph. The darker areas are the very low density parts of the body, like the air in your lungs, which absorb very little and as a result look more dark. And the white areas are the high density areas such as bone, which absorb more and look more white. Anyways, all that to say that if all things left constant, the cathode side would look darker and the anode side would look whiter. And this non-uniformity can potentially obscure diagnostic detail and affect the accuracy of interpretations. Because you don't want one part of your x-ray to look really good and the other parts to look really over or underexposed. So what do we do? Well, given what we know about the anode heal effect, how can we actually take advantage of this difference in x-ray intensity? Well, it all comes down to the anatomy. Think of the thickness and density of the anatomy you're trying to image. If I know that one part of the body is larger or more dense than the other side, well, I can actually take advantage of that by putting the cathode end of the beam towards the denser part of the anatomy, right? Now, this doesn't really apply to small areas such as our extremities, but it could apply to imaging of the spine, pelvis and hips, and especially if you're doing what's called a HBL hip which stands for a horizontal beam lateral hip x-ray, where the patient can't move and so you can't move them sideways for a lateral projection. So the next best thing is to bring one leg up and shoot through the groin area to get a lateral looking image, but with the horizontal beam on the x-ray tube, hence the name horizontal beam lateral. And so you'd wanna put the cathode end, which is the higher intensity x-rays towards the abdomen pelvis area and the anode end towards the femur, the leg. Just because depending on the person, there could be a two to one density and thickness difference in that area. So all that, along with the increasing of the tube distance or SID, we can help mitigate the effects of the anode heel effect. So in summary, even though there are challenges in terms of image quality and dose distribution, if you just take a second to understand why the anode heal effect is happening, you know, thinking of the geometry of what's going on in the x-ray tube, then it's hard to find it overwhelming and you won't forget it because then all you have to do is find the cathode end of the tube and you know that part is more intense. All right, that's it for this one. If anything didn't make sense, just refresh the page. And if you have any questions, pop them in the comment section below because I do read everything. If you found this video helpful, I really appreciate a like. Now, if you haven't seen my video breakdown of an x-ray tube, click here to watch that. I think you'll find it quite useful. See you there. Stay curious.